You think you know about relationships, but you're wrong. Listen, there's no magic bullet. I'm teaching life skills. When you sick, you need medicine. It don't always taste good. Nah. But it'll get you better. You, you, you need this medicine. Yeah. It ain't gonna always taste good. But this is what you need. Men and women, bottom line, we need to have the conversation. Your partner wants to give up control, but only if you know how to drive. This is about being the best you you could ever be, whoever you are. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, LGBTQ, space alien. I'll save anybody. I don't care. I'll teach a hedgehog how to have a threesome. What do you mean by that? Look, you don't have to listen to me, but you're wrong. Listen, I know I'm great. And I know you're thinking, Dante, there's no way I could be like you. But you could be me, you know why? Because you know who I was? Before I was me, I was you. you. Man score, 202. Better hear what I've got to say because you won't get it again. I'm not an alpha male. I'm not a beta male either. I'm just a better man. Better man. Well, put your happiness first, because if you don't, they won't. What's up, Square Pimp Brigade? Uh, welcome to uh, the Pimp Cup. Uh, this is uh, GYBB, Get Your Balls Back, WWDD. What would Dante do? The sexual revolution is being podcasted. And I am truly, truly excited. We were trying to get this guy on. We got a special guest. Now, I know I have said that uh, 500 times before, mm. but this time mm. I mean it. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. Finally, I don't have to lie about it. <laughs> to be very legitimately excited. <laughs> um, Harry, how you doing? You feeling good? Oh, Dante, I'm feeling great, except I'm having a tough time keeping these gators down. Post-election, even. It is. Still. It is difficult. Pimping ain't easy, but it gets easy with more practice. Anyway, um, I want to introduce the guest here. Uh, this is a, a good friend of mine, very funny and talented dude. Um, we we spent a lot of time together in the last uh, last couple of during the COVID and stuff. Give it up for Mateo Lane, y'all. Give it up for Mateo yeah. Lane. Yeah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> probably one of the most beautiful men I've known uh, that I've ever met. Oh my God! Come on. He's like, oh, stop it. Maybe <laughs> maybe maybe just in the world of comedy, but. <laughs> nah. I don't know. I mean, even I'm, I ain't gonna lie. Harry has talked about how beautiful you are You're as well. Beautiful man, you look at man. I mean, if you if you want to go to our YouTube page and see, Mateo's just in his. Uh, it's not a, technically a muscle T-shirt, but I guess any T-shirt Mateo wears <laughs> is a muscle is shirt by definition. This a is muscle like my t-shirt. house coat. Like my right. Nana has her house coat. This is like my house coat. Just like a tank top and short shorts. And, I mean, it's hot in my apartment. They have the radiators blasting. It sounds like Mariah Carey is singing in my kitchen all day. Like, <laughs> it's hot. So. Mateo is dressed the way uh, the GOP thinks that gay people dress <laughs> in the city. And they're like, that's exactly what we're scared of. This is what, what we, this, this makes me uncomfortable. uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I bet you the way I dress does make people uncomfortable. Well, not in New York. New York is no, hard to no. turn an eye. You know, really I mean, people, care, but, people but, you, you could walk by in a chicken costume and someone would be like, anyways, as I was saying, like, they just yeah. don't. <laughs> There's no, no time for it. You want to hear something funny today? I saw a guy on an electric uh, scooter with a helmet that was a chicken helmet. It was he had it was it, yellow feathers on it. It had the little red thing on the top. I was like, what? the?" F-? And then I was like, I ah, got to go home and have a podcast with Mateo. Can't wait now. I just was like, whatever. I think 2020 should have been like, look, let your freak flag fly. Who gives a shit? Everything <laughs> sucked this year. If you want to wear a chicken hat, go for it. Pence 2020. Oh, um, God. <laughs> Thank God they're gone. Thank God. Well, they ain't gone yet. They're not gone yet. I mean, they're on their way out. You know, it's like when you're at a party, and the party's ruined and they're a drunk guest and they're ruining everything. Right, We're right. We're at that stage now where we finally have someone pushing them out the door. Right, the, the lights are are on <laughs> oh, yes like, oh they're gone they're almost gone oh. their lights are on and the, and people are sweeping and they're still like, oh, they're, i don't understand why the, the bar like, the the party's on. over there, there's a lot of uh a lot of what drunk people love doing is what did i say what what, what did i do <laughs> i was just being nice i um, was just having fun and they're just I being escorted around wildly drunk people oh it my is god just 
insufferable. So but then when you're drunk and you're around drunk people, it's fabulous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because you're like a birds of a feather. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the funny thing is, uh, so uh, I, Harry knows this, but uh, me and me, and Mateo, Liz, and, and Keith Robinson have been hanging out pretty. We've been we've been uh, experimenting with different cuisine. We we well, go. We, we, we try, but we've pretty much just stuck to Italian. Yeah, stuck to <laughs> for, for, and and stuck to maybe three restaurants. <laughs> well, Keith loves Lupa, which I yeah. like Lupa. Um, it's a Roman restaurant, but then uh, there's a Sicilian place that I've been going to for years called Piccola Cucina. We finally brought y'all there and Keith was furious. This place is so fucking good. Fuck you. You're hiding it from me. You've been keeping this place from me. Like we're keeping anything from you. I got a <laughs> Harry. Harry just sent me a link of Keith just bashing uh, Bobby Kelly on, <laughs> on some podcast. I'll send it to on you. Just like, he does that in sleep. <laughs> but, he um, thinks he's a podcaster. People gotta tell him he ain't nothing. He's not even a good person. Damn it! You stink, Bobby. You, you stink, stink, Bobby. You stink. <laughs> Why you got seventeen people on the show? Damn it! There's no direction. <laughs> um, it, it's it's funny because it, you know, um, me me and Mateo, we've been f- like friends for a while. But a friend, I remember Mateo was going through this thing with some Dominican dude was driving him c- nuts. So. And um, like seven, six years ago, or something. Yeah, yeah, it was about six. Yeah, ago. wow, we we have known each other that long, right? Mateo, can you pull yeah. that mic a little closer? Is that the one you're? Sorry, doing? I just don't want to like breathe on it. And then no, you that's hear fine. Me, that's like, fine. Is this better? Yeah, that's better. Work. Yeah. This is my gaming headset. This is my. Uh, I just look like a gayer pilot. But um, <laughs> no, yeah, because we met at we met at Stand Up New York. I want to say when I was doing yes. um, check spots. Becky was working there, and Becky. Yeah, had me yeah, 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 spots. yeah. Wow, that, I don't. Wow, it's been that long. That's dope. And and um, what you call it was going well. It, I don't know. If we, I don't know if we'll go into the whole the whole story how it ended, but. But um, I mean, we can. I was there was okay. this guy. He was gorgeous, and it, we had this. There, you sort of met us. You met me at the beginning of our yeah, your little endeavor. Oh my god, this relationship, right? And we were. I first of all, I have to say, I was twenty six, twenty seven, or something like mm-hmm. that. About thirty pounds lighter, or twenty pounds lighter, and <laughs> just new to the city, and had a mullet. And I loved this Dominican guy and he, we would go out on dates, but he was very like, he, like would push me back. Yeah. And then I just didn't know how, like, but of course it was like, like you said, like not having the accessibility to him, him stopping that was making me want him more. Right. Right. And I was, I think you caught me when I was like, I really like this guy and he doesn't like me back and I don't know what to do. Yeah. And you were like, you gotta, <laughs> you just like sat me down and gave me all this advice. <laughs> And then him I, and I didn't talk like, like Mateo, Mateo, come in, sit down, sit down. Sit down. Right. <laughs> but it, you know what? It, it, that's so strange because that relationship ended up being we we did date, and then we became really good friends, and then we became like friends that you know dated on and off, and it was like this kind of one of those relationships that there's no definition to it. It's abstract in the sense that when you're with, like when we would see each other, we'd be with each other. It was like, we're dating. And that was mm. 24 hours. Then he would go off and we would just resume our own lives. And then, right. but then we would text all the time, mainly about Pokemon. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it, it was, it ended up becoming a really beautiful relationship. And then unfortunately he passed in February. Okay. So it was, it was, a uh, it was a very, it was the full gamut of emotions with this goddamn relationship yeah but he was great he was so wonderful as a person well the, the thing i think that the interesting thing is that um so initially when i you know we've been we've been doing the podcast what now but harry like eight years eight right years at this point yeah eight years so and and i've changed you know my you know i i you know i doing this with patrice and it was very kind of rigid and stuff and then and then you know gender became so much, you know, the way we accepted and became so much more fluid and, and so on and so forth. And then I had to kind of readjust because, um, um, we used to talk about, you know, masculinity and femininity and, and in a very kind of, uh, kind of boxed in way, you mm-hmm. know, and, and then I, I, what I, so I, I, so I was dealing this and I wanted to be able to, 
give advice or at least take the principles that I thought were, were applied and be able to apply it to LGBT community as well. And so the model kind of became not so much masculine and feminine, but dominant and submissive. Um, because it, uh, we, because I'm just trying to make sense. I like, I knew that there was a, a, a specific truth to what I was saying, but I didn't know how to readjust it to the LGBT community. And I, I think the first thing was we had, um, there was a, a, a good friend of ours. I'll tell you who it is later, but she's a lesbian and she, she was dating this girl or trying to date this girl who was putting her in the friend zone. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and I, and I, you know, you, well, just you learn that the, the rules of the friend zone, it, it applies no matter what the, the sex of the person is, whether it's right. lesbians, a gay men, like the rules are the same. You know, because it's it's really dominant and 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 submissive. It's the person that's more aggressive and the person that's that's less aggressive or whatever. And when you when you figure out what the principles are, then it, that when you, when you figure out how it fits in, then the principles apply. And I um and she's a real good friend of mine, and so I you know I wanted her to win, and so we had her on, and I we kind I kind of explained kind of the same principles I would have told a dude if he was being put in the friend zone and so that was kind of the same thing that was happening with you I, I, but at that point in time I had been doing that with with my gay and lesbian friends in any way is you know, this like were, a really like exaggerated elegant way for you to just call me a bottom um <laughs> Hmm. We weren't I, that I, there, I, but I, I, I guess I, now I, we know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I wasn't, I mean. It's like the Torah to be like, guys, Mateo's a bottom. No, I, <laughs> I, I get that. I also think too, like, you know, like the, the obviously the rules of what, it, what gender is and uh -huh. um, the confinements of that, I think is not something that's applicable only to the queer community, but also exists predominantly in the straight community. It's just that, we probably have an easier time tapping into uh, maybe those subjects than straight people. In a lot of ways, straight men, I find, have a really hard time, um, not all straight men, but this is generally speaking, like straight cis men have a hard time like releasing the the confinements of what society wants them to be, like dress sure. a certain way, talk a certain way, look a certain way, act a certain way, this and and I understand it because coming as an outsider growing up, I just everything I was just constantly trying to emulate and be that thing because I knew what was I actually was was hated. So, you know, I think if you're straight, it's just it's maybe you just you're not so aware of you're playing to the script because everything tells you to be that way from Disney movies to TV mm -hmm. shows to magazines to leaders to religious figures to family members to like I had nowhere to look. That's why I have that joke. Like the first gay person I saw on TV was C-3PO. So it's <laughs> like, you know, I think now with like more queer people or at least even straight cis men who are more comfortable in their feminine side is it's, it's like the release of this sort of masculine uh, straight jacket that I think a lot of guys wear. Now, that being said, if you're a guy who likes football and you go hunting and all this stuff, like, it's not to say like you're wrong and you're playing to the patriarch. No, you like that stuff and that's yeah. who you are. You know, the yeah. same way that I, as a kid, love to dress up like Sleeping Beauty and sing to the birds. It's like I think <laughs> it's just whatever, whatever fits you, um, whatever like costume that fits you, it makes you feel most comfortable in yourself. Is is the one you should lead with. I think it's when you think that the way you act is how others are supposed to act is when it starts to become problematic. But yeah, I would agree with that. Like if you're talking about relationships, straight, gay, whatever, I think there's generally speaking, yeah, there probably is one more dominant and more submissive in mm -hmm. terms of energy because it's that energy that lures you to someone or brings you to somebody. Yeah. And the situation with me and, you know, my friend, I don't want to say his name, but um, you don't have to. He, he was definitely more dominant. Right. And I was just like, God, I was like a wet puddle. I was like Alex Mack when she would turn into a puddle. Like I was just like, <laughs> could not get it yeah. together. I have more confidence now, but yeah. Well, I, I, I find that it's, you know, even when two people are connected, no matter what, when two people are 
doing something together, somebody at some point has to defer to somebody else. It's like it's the reason that there's a, a co-pilot and the person who is the head pilot. At some point, somebody has to take control or make a decision. It can't always be 50-50. Even if you respect the other person, you go back and forth. The idea to me of 50-50, eventually somebody has to step up and make a decision in well, 50, all 50, aspects 50, of life. That's, I mean, Harry's trying to tell you that he's my bottom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I but, can I tell mean, by the know. pink mic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How dare he show femininity? No, um, <laughs> kidding. Uh, I think, t- I think too, like it, all, it, it also depends on what you're talking about. Like sexuality, like a sexual energy with somebody else has a lot to, at least with me sometimes has a lot to do with determining how that relationship is going to look mm-hmm. because to me, I have a lot of insecurities and sex is something that I will either use or look to, to validate me. And so, or at least validate my existence or if somebody likes me, it's, everything with me stems from wanting to be liked. I've talked about this with my therapist forever. And so I think, you know, that sort of sexual energy can determine, like, I just think it can determine a lot in the relationship. Sometimes, at least for me, I've I've made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It's funny because um, I think that I've just through observation is I always look at, you know, I look at people, you know, at who they are. And and, and I've, I've said this to to Mateo we were talking about this the other day and I was saying Mateo is super creative, super talented. He's in great shape. He's a good person. He's a, a kind person. It's like, you know, if you, if you're stacking up the, the, you know, on paper, you're stacking it up. It's, it's really, really through the roof. And so for me, it was always difficult to understand, trying to understand where the insecurity comes from. Do you ever did you ever think about because I mean, I mean, look, um, I've, I've watched Mateo sing opera. Uh, he could do the he could do the Mariah Carey whistle. You know, <laughs> like he does. a um, What's the imp- I love that fucking impression you do. Uh, the one that Bobby loves you do. Uh, oh, Liza, Liza Minnelli. Yeah, the old the old Liza. Would you do it, yeah. please? <laughs> uh, uh, yes. I'm so excited. I'll I'll never forget the first thing my mother said to me. She said, Liza, call an ambulance. (laughs) I also look just like Liza Minnelli. (laughs) So it's it's like I for me it's always difficult to to go, man, I mean this person this this individual is so talented and so creative. Where do you think the insecurity comes from? Well, I mean, most of it stems from my childhood and being gay and not having any answers and a lot of internalized hate and being made fun of. And I think, you know, as much strength as I've, I mean, I would say my awakening was in college when I went to art school and I Mm -hmm. was friends with this. Look, growing up at, I'm 34 now. So even in the nineties, like it was coming out of the AIDS pandemic, it was still very puritanical. Being gay was taboo. Queer people on TV were very far and few between. And mm-hmm. our stories were either like how, the, you know, the AIDS crisis or we were the butt of the joke. You know, I mean, right, the right. fact that I'm even doing stand up is in a way strange because I didn't have anybody to see growing up do stand up that looked You didn't have any role models like that you me. could follow. I mean, I did, but they were women. Mm-hmm. It's always been women. They've been my strength because mm-hmm. I didn't see gay men. Um, I mean, I did, but if I did, you never, it was you like, never saw Lost in Space. <laughs> was, no, <laughs> I never the did best. see Lost in Space. Was someone gay on it, or were they just like? Oh my god, Doctor Smith was. Doctor Smith was, well, he Smith was like, openly oh, gay. Oh, William, please save me. He was like off. <laughs> Um, the oh, other so they were like Paul Lynn. Like, I mean, wasn't he? Well, Paul Lynn was on the ghost. The ghost of Mister Mrs. Muir. Right. He, Paul he was, was on Hollywood <laughs> Square. Oh, 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 Girls, come on. How? You know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, um, I, but I think, like, I, basically what I'm trying to say is I didn't have anywhere to go to figure out who I was, what I was. And so it was all about trying to hide what I was, because if I was discovered, all hell would break loose. Now, was it was your family supportive of it or were they not supportive? No, my family is. They're very, I come from a very, I'm very lucky. Like I come from a very supportive family. That being said, my whole family was, they all 
deal with their issues through humor. Now, when I say my family, my growing up was with all of my cousins. We're all the okay. same age. Extended. All my aunts and uncles. Right. It's it's never just like my five, like my mom, my dad, brother, and sister. It was like, there's Everybody. 30 of us. You know, that's <laughs> what I mean by the family. Somewhat a so, traditional American Italian family. Yes. Very big family. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think we all dealt with it through humor. So when I came out, I used humor to have to get everyone to deal with it. How did you do that? How did you do that? Make jokes, make things funny, lighten things up. Mm. Um, I mean, they would come see me do my family. I think my mom and my aunt Cindy had such a traumatic childhood with my grandfather and the stuff, you know, it's just, I think that by the time that they had kids, they just knew to love their kids. It Mm -hmm. didn't matter. Not my situation is not everyone's situation. I remember I did a show once in Chicago at sidetrack, a gay bar and 30 members of my family came, my grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my aunts, my aunts all, yeah. yeah. And then afterwards, this older gentleman came up to me to be like, oh, it's so nice that your family came to see you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, they're so silly and annoying and blah, blah, blah. And he was shaking my hand. And he squeezed my hand and he looked at me and he said, you're so lucky that you have your family here to be with you. And just his whole life oh, his pain before my eyes. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. like, this is, you know, I really am in a very lucky situation. So I've always been grateful at, for the fact that I have my cousins and my aunts and my mom and my sister. Like, I have a very supportive family. But yeah. that being said, before you come out, I think people are confused. They're like, I hate when people say, we knew you were gay before you did. It's such a condescending mm-hmm. thing to say to somebody. And they don't realize how belittling and mean that can be. Because the internalized, for me at least, the internalized hate that I was experiencing and how that manifested isn't salvageable by someone being like, oh, we knew you were gay. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you didn't know what I was going through. Like, right, you didn't right, understand right. Like, my existence. Like, yeah. my existence was watching religious leaders say I'm going to hell and teachers make fun of gay people and kids make fun of gay people. Yeah. Now yeah. things are different and it's great. Um, but I mean, I think all my insecurities, to get back to what you were saying, all my yeah. insecurities come from those days and i don't know if they ever quite leave you so like i can go to the gym and change how i look and i can write funny jokes and go on stage and all that but like that the 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 13 year old mateo is still kind of like oh god so you don't really you don't really believe in a way it's almost like you don't really believe how talent and i mean harry you gotta see his artwork is i've seen some of it i've seen some of it on instagram amazing it's and, unfair it's ridiculous it's, uh, it's it gets you annoyed you're like that's not fair to have two talents <laughs> well that's more than right. that that's you gotta right. hear him speak uh, and sing sings, operas and i forgot uh, he sings is, too yeah uh, so what what's interesting you know even about that is like i it's man you know i, I you know so i don't know if i ever told you this but my my uh, you know my my aunt my my well first of all i wanted to say something about immigrant parents like uh and that's this is pretty much a, a generalization and i think immigrant parents they all come from a place where there's this this kind of struggle to make it and so a lot of times if your kids just live if, if you keep from them dying then you, you're like especially like uh second generation immigrants so so the understanding of of self self fulfillingness and happiness and that they, they, they don't really get that like my dad was born 1920 and he grew up in Jim Crow you know what i mean right. like i my my dad my dad went to world war 2 and when he he stormed the, the you know he was in in, in normandy. normandy and and, and when the black soldiers more walked through the towns, the little French kids ran behind him to see if he had tails because the white soldiers had said that he, he, that black soldiers, black men had tails. Like this mm-hmm. is the kind of, kind of warp shit that was going on. And so, you know, it was, you know, you come back and you're living up, you're growing up in Jim Crow and then you, you have to find, like, it's not about happiness or pursuing your, your best self or self-fulfillment. It's like, just survive, like get an education, get a job, do this, do this, you know, like that. And so we're at a place where, you know, that, that became more prevalent where you want, you want to, you want to pursue happiness, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, 
that's that's very different from what they've gone through. You know, it it was just like being survival, and so you know, they, nobody went to therapy, and you just kind of worked it out. You oh, yelled no it out. No one went to therapy. Not a <laughs> single one of them. Not no one. I think I I know what you mean because like I even look at my own parents. So my father is. Uh, of Irish descent, like super, mm. but very American, not mm. like, oh, mm. tati, tatar, like yeah, 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 yeah. no cultural heritage. Yeah. And when he was 19, you know, drafted into Vietnam, he was a helicopter pilot. I'm oh, sure God. I watched most of his friends die, yeah. came back and his parents had sold his car that he had worked so hard for. It's, oh, we didn't know you were going to come back. I mean, that was Jeez. like, wow. you know, you were a, you're a man. Yeah. I'm in yeah. quotations, you're a man. So uh-huh. you know, he becomes a police officer and just, I'm sure there's, so many issues he had to deal with. And then you've got my mother, my mother's, you know, mother's Italian, father's Mexican. Mm-hmm. And they ha- he has five kids. My grandpa has five kids with my grandma. And he also has kids with another woman, names all the kids the same names so he doesn't confuse them. <laughs> so my mom is going between living in a house where there's, you know, the dad's either gone or when he's there, there's fighting and she's got to live with her grandparents. And mm-hmm. you know, it's like, from what it's like, and also like what, when they divorce, like no more Mexican family, just gone. Like <laughs> my grandma was like, they're just gone. But like, wait, we have all, <laughs> all this Mexican, and no, 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 gone. You know, and then my grandpa who re- married my grandma, my mom was 12. He's, they're a Sicilian. Mm. And um, he was, he went blind at the age of five and put, and put himself through law school and became a judge and they were poor. And, you know, he was downtown Chicago with a, with a stick. And it's like, God, so it's like, yeah, by the time we're born, it's like, I'm gay. My parents are both like, shut up. <laughs> We've it's, been through enough in our goddamn life. Who gives a shit? Uh, <laughs> luckily, like it that. worked out the other way. Yeah. Side note, <laughs> as, as far as immigrant parents and names, I have an uncle Elvis. That's right, Elvis. And he, has two, he has two children named Elvis Jr. from different <laughs> marriages. Are you, what's your, Harry, what's your... I'm um, half Ecuadorian, half Armenian. And that's the Ecuadorian oh, side. Do you? So, sp- yeah, a, a lot of Latino families have like the the names. Like my ex had like seven names in one. They're from Venezuela. Oh yeah, and they just keep just, adding on. They just keep adding. On. It's like, well, all my brothers are named Carlos because my dad's named Carlos, so I have Carlos. But I'm also Enrique, and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we just Dan- keep adding but, on. But to like echo what you're saying, Dante, I get it. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I think the more generations go on, not to say that obviously things aren't harder, but some of our parents come from more difficult yeah. living. And so now that we're in this place where it's like, well, we're free to think about our thoughts and what makes us happy and our desires. Right. And do I want kids? Do I even want to get married? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, right. these are not things that I think a lot of people were privileged to think, think about or have access to. Yeah, so it's, I, a, it's an interesting time to live in. Yeah, I uh, like my 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 dad's old. Like, so my dad came from um, sixteen brothers, sixteen brothers and sisters, eight and eight. My oldest aunt, I think she's born eighteen ninety two, something like that. God and, damn! And she, her husband died early on, and so she was just a widow, and she used to cater. And so at the time in the, in the 60s and 70s, when gay men would get thrown out of their house for being gay, she would take them in. So I had... Your, your ten, aunt's RuPaul? <laughs> I was older before RuPaul. Wow. He's the, she's the pre-Paul. <laughs> she's and, Lady Bunny. Got it. Okay. And um, she, she used to take gay men in when they would you know and they would stay in her she had this house and it was actually the house that my that her brothers and sisters grew up that she she ended up living in and so as a kid i had a bunch of gay uncles my (laughs) uncle horace my uncle my my godfather was gay and so like i was the only kid in third grade with a with a silk ascot a paisley ascot (laughs) (laughs) and so you know that was just kind of always in it was just always in our neighborhood now something that i talk about a lot is that you know growing up hip-hop in the 80s and the 90s you almost can't grow up hip hop and not be homophobic in a certain. So I had this kind of duality of. But also to be fair, you couldn't grow up and not be. You, you had to be homophobic yeah. 
Period. Like everything. I mean, women working at Joanne Fabrics were like, that faggot. Like, everybody <laughs> was homophobic. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Right, but right. I, I'm kidding. I, I understand what right, you're saying. But, you, yeah. but I had that duality because there were these, you know, I had these uncles who used to, I mean, I had a, I had a pair of two-tone, I had a pair of two-tone cowboy boots, uh, lizard and snake cowboy boots when I was in, like, uh, seventh grade, like wow. you know, well, it's I nice mean, to see that you grew out of that, Dante, yeah, I mean, and that know. it didn't have a, a long-lasting <laughs> impact on your fashion choice and lifestyle. I mean, you know, other than my blue cookie monster fox fur, other than that, it's fine. So, um, <laughs> but it, it's it's interesting because um, so it being present in that and kind of them being part of the family, like when we had family gathers, they would just part, you know, they were, you know. Horace and and my father used to always say really uh you know he would pick up a salami what do you think of this Richard you know like he would just, just and, then, and we would laugh and laugh and laugh. so um you know it's a, it's an interesting kind of dynamic for me and then when I when I got older and I started I was bouncing um you couldn't get gay clubs couldn't get good bouncers because of, because of the homophobia. So I used to bounce at all the gay balls. House oh, of Ninja, House of <laughs> Chanel. That must House have been Chan- so much fun. <laughs> oh, they, oh, they were out of them. I, rem- I remember, the f- I, was, <laughs> I don't know if I told you this, Harry. I, yeah. I remember frisking the, the, the guys when they came in and everybody had a bag. And, then, and, and every time I go in the bag, there'd be duct tape and, and scissors, right? And I'm going, I don't... I oh, don't you know. Yeah, we piece was it together. Out. So why does everybody have duct tape? You know, like, so, so it was like, and I, you know, and and I mean, you know, they vicious. Like I, re- I remember stopping a guy from hitting another dude in the head with a hammer. Like just had a hammer. In the in the like viciousness, like it's because someone said Madonna wasn't talented, so he picked up that hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, We're very you can't say about things like Jesus. that without consequences, Mateo. Yeah, you gotta... that's how I feel. If someone disses Barbara Streisand, I'm like, get me a fucking hammer. <laughs> it's preferably a ball peen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's 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 interesting that that um that 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 not you know coming from immigrants and the, the time and the area and then and then even when it's lifted when it's when it's easier to to kind of pursue your happiness and kind of you know like you say let your freak flag flow you you still are like it always being around you is always crazy to me your insecurities and i and i'm like when i i like i just think and i've said this to harry i mean if i'm lying about it i'm dying i've said how talented I think you are and in, in, yeah. in, in, in our own person. I mean, we've been friends for 20 years and stuff like that. And I've spoke to him ab- yeah. about your, you know, how talented well, we and, always, and- I, uh, Mateo, a lot of people love Mateo, man. I'm always excited to see Mateo. You know, I remember seeing Mateo when he first started, like, so I, I had a question about this, like as far as insecurity, is that part of why you started lifting and getting in shape? Cause I remember you coming through as a, like a, a skinnier kid, Skinny. a younger kid, still in shape. <laughs> But does that have anything to do with why you got? I remember seeing Mateo the first time. I go, this guy got in fucking amazing shit. Like I patted his arm. You ever pat somebody's arm? And you go, what the fuck? What the fuck? Well, I would. Okay, so a couple things. First thing about my insecurity, I would say I'm like, I'm sort of two different people. I think when I'm on stage, uh, I feel very secure. I feel very. I think I'm so I think I'm so um superficial in the sense that I allow looks to sort of dictate everything and I that's my biggest weakness I think and so like for example if I walk into gay events I start to like like hide because I'm afraid I'm being judged for how I look rather than anything else and I know in comedy if I go sit at the cellar everyone's judged me based off of my performance or my jokes. And so I feel more at ease. And when I'm on stage, I feel the most attractive. Like I feel confident. Um, I feel like I have something to show and I feel like I, I feel like I'm make, I, I'm making, I'm, I, I, when I'm creating, I feel the most attractive, I guess Mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say. Um, And then the other part of me is, sort of always living in this like insecure superficial mess 
But that also being said, the working, the working out thing, a lot, I mean, a lot of it was like, obviously like I would like to look and feel better. And I think I'd like to be more sexually desirable and all that stuff. But a part of it too, is it's family. My sister is an IFBB pro. She's an international wow, really? bodybuilder. And I've always been interested in the gym, but again, it's not a place that was very queer friendly growing up. And so I just didn't know how to go to the gym. I had no one to teach me how to go to the gym. I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid to go to the gym because it was just this sort of like locker room, Ah, just everything about it was so, I was so insecure. So I finally just called my sister one day. I remember where I was, I was in Dayton, Ohio. Lisa Mm -hmm. Traeger and I were doing a show. She was busy yelling at the audience. (laughs) <laughs> and I called my sister and said, I want to do it. I want to gain weight and do muscle, blah, blah, blah. I'll follow it. Just write me Tell a me diet. Tell me what to do. Tell yeah. me what to do and I'll do it. And she said, mm-hmm. okay. So she said, write for the next week what you eat. And I was like, okay. And I never thought about food that way. I would wake up, have coffee, cereal, and then maybe mm-hmm. not eat for another four hours and maybe mm-hmm. make pasta. Maybe that. You know, I know what I was doing. Right. So she was like, you want to gain muscle? Here's your workout routine. She wrote it all down for me. She goes, when you wake up, you're going to have two bagels for breakfast and you're going to have seven egg whites with that. And I was like, oh my God, that's the most, why would I eat so much food? Now, obviously I've like- You understand. Diet's changed, right. Yeah. But at the time she just wanted to put weight on me. Right, 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 and right. And I just followed everything she said. And I would say three months went by and with that eating and the working out at the same time, I started to notice a huge change in my body, but mm-hmm. so did everybody else. Right. I mean, everybody so they was, were talking about it. Yeah. Oh my God. Everybody was complimenting and commenting and I was getting attention from God. Like it, like it did change, you know? And so I liked that feeling. And so I just kept that going. And then obviously I do like the very gay Instagram naked sort of like, you know, photos and mm-hmm. this and that. And, but I really enjoy doing that too. You work with a lot of really interesting artists and photographers and I just show up and I'm like, what do you want me to do? They'll be like, get naked and go sit there. I don't care. I think it's fun. So right. again, part of me is really insecure and then part of me feels very secure. I'm kind of like two people, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody is to a certain extent. I mean, there's a there's a moment where we're, you know, where we're, I, I think the, the, the goal is to take you know, that ideal self and then and then overlap that real self so that you can't see the 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 ideal self and the real self. They kind of sync up Um, the it's interesting because whenever I, you know, talk to guys and they're having problems and they feel insecure. One of the things that I tell them is whatever is broke, you have to fix it. So if you don't feel as though you're attractive enough or you think, you know, I'd ask, what are the things that you're insecure about? I, will you fix it? If you don't like your body, you got to fix it. If you can't dance, you got to take a dance class. If you're not interesting, you need to read a book and you need to travel. And you so these things that you because a lot of times people love you for who you are. I mean, some people don't. Some people are superficial. But the fact that there's this always pending insecurity, you you communicate this insecurity, whether it it permeates everything you do, Mm -hmm. because it's 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 sort of like um, when somebody takes a um, somebody takes a lie detector test and they're they're lying. Uh, they're lying about something so they sweat profusely or they or their their heart rate changes or their eye movement or whatever and and those things those things are so autonomic or what is it autonomic autonomic whatever anyway uh instinctual stuff kind of happens anyway because you can't really fake it and so what i realize is that the the lack of confidence permeates everything that you do it permeates your walk your talk it's just it's like you said when you walk in to a gay bar or something you feel this judgment, even though the judgment might, might not be there. But oh, it's all you, within my own mind. Right, 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 right. It's all in your own head. Um, and so to fix it, um, to fix it is the thing that kind of cures it. So I'm wondering, like, I guess I'm wondering why. I mean, you, you, you're talented and you're in shape and you're this and the other. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of wondering where the insecurity still comes from when you fix those things, because that's always the thing that I've I, always. I think it's just embedded. I mean, I don't think it's something that I'll ever quite get over, but I'm, I'm, I, if, 
if you could see how I was 15 years ago versus today, mm-hmm. you, it's, a, it's a complete it's transformation. I mean, I think yeah. the base of a human doesn't change. I think like who we are when we're born is just who we yeah. are forever. We just evolve, but the base is always the same. Yeah. And so that was just my base. I mean, I'm a very sensitive person. I worry all the time what people think about me. And I like to seek approval. And I think I've learned my lesson based off, it doesn't matter how well I sing or how well I craft a joke or how many muscles I gain. It doesn't quite fix the thing that you feel on the inside. But who I am on the inside and how I feel on the inside has changed drastically. And, if, and there's always sort of like key people in your life who help you get to a better place. A few people that really, like there was a guy who I don't, I haven't spoken to him in forever, but I love him. His name was Micah. And this is when I was in college and I had just come out and I was f- so afraid of my own fucking shadow. I was afraid of everything. I was not this sort of like confident, but joke ball busty. Mm-hmm. Like even when we're sitting at dinner and Keith is reading me for <laughs> filth, I like that. Like I can take that now. I would right. not have been able to take that 10 years ago. Really? But I remember in college, I just was so afraid of my own shadow. And this guy, Micah just was like, Ugh, just the, the pillar of strength to me. I mean, he was queer. He was Korean adopted by this Jewish family and he had the most interesting life. He had, you know, black sisters who were also adopted and he was, you know, from Korea and he had this like amazing look with this long hair and the low V-neck shirt and he smoked and he was tough and he was funny and he was smart. And he sort of took me under his wing and taught me t- how to have a sense of humor about being gay and taught me how to not just be afraid of everyone. If someone calls you a faggot, you know, yeah. You know, it's like have that kind of mentality (laughs) to it. And I just thought his life was fascinating. He was fascinating. And he was, I would say the first mark of like having the first mark of my sense of humor. When you see me on stage is like Mm. having strength and the thing I was afraid of when I was younger. So in a way, my insecurities play a lot into my strength. So Mm -hmm. when I, it's kind of this cycle, like when I'm on stage and I'm talking about uh, being gay or my childhood or people's perception of me, those are me saying, this is how I feel bad about myself. But the joke is me building myself up with strength. And it really has helped me. I mean, I I would say if there was a spectrum to like how bad I felt about myself, if it was at a 10 when I was 21, Mm. it's probably at like a three now. Like, I mean, it's really improved, but Again, I don't know if that ever fully goes away. Yeah. I, it gets better for sure. But I also come, you know, Italians are very look based and so are gays. So I get a double whammy from <laughs> right. people who are obsessed with looks. And then it, I think that that's the most important thing. And it's not. Ugh. You know, it, it's, it's weird because for me, like my, my dad was so like it, it wasn't my mom that was overprotective. My dad was so overprotective. And so, you know, if I went to play in the street, you're going to get hit by a car. Don't you know, like I, I, I wasn't able to use his power tools until I was 23. Do you know what I mean? Cause he was like, you're going to cut your hand off, you know? Um, so I had to buy my own, but what, what happened for me to switch for me was I just got tired of being afraid. I got mm-hmm. just tired of being scared. And then for me, the, the um so I, I tend to be really pragmatic and so in and that's I would I, I was like thirteen and I was like well what what is what's the essence of fear and how does it how does it how does it how does it work? Mm. And when I found that whenever I was presented with an option, the longer I took to access the option, the more the fear grew. So um, like I was scared of girls and I was scared to dance and I was scared to, you know, I was scared of everything. Um, so it, so like I, I tell this story all the time. Like if I went to a dance, like sometimes to ask a girl to dance was paralyzing to me. So when I walked in, I would see somebody who I wanted to dance and I would go, I would walk in the party and I would go, do you want to dance? I would go right to her. What, do you want to dance? And she would go, yeah, yeah, sure. And I was like, all right, let me go put my coat down because I had literally just walked in. And so dealing with the, the, the speed in which I would access the opportunity, it, like 
because the longer you take, the more the fear, your brain starts to eat you up and, and, and your fear starts to grow and grow until you, you're, you're literally paralyzed with the fear. Then it became a situation. So, so for me, I was like, well, how does this work? So as long as I access the, the, the fear, the, the opportunity right away, I could remove the fear. The problem was that then that became how I operated on everything. Mm. So if I was in the street and some guy said, who the fuck are you? You ain't, I would punch him in the face. And then you start to realize Wow, everybody, nobody's, nobody really wants that smoke. You know, like, like people yap and they talk and stuff, but if you swing first, they crumble under the pressure because they were just faking it anyway. And then it made me understand that everybody has yeah, these insecurities. I was, was going to say it's a really good point is that like everybody is fear-based. I yeah. think not everybody, but I think to a certain extent we're all fear-based because I think if we really, life is ho- scary. <laughs> it's horrifying. Rejection is horrifying. And, yeah. um, you know, confidence can be horrifying. I mean, all of it. I think yeah. success, I think there's people that are afraid of success. I sure, think there's sure. people who are afraid of taking risks. I think that, you know, so I don't know. I, I think, you know, now I'm 34, which I know is not old, but it's like, being in my 20s was stressful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like, right, 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 right. It was, it, I'm just happy that I can be 30. And if I just want to sit and play Fortnite on a Saturday night, I can do it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what? And like in sex, the, to get sex now is something like, I don't have to walk up to someone and ask them to dance at a club. It's just like, right. send a few pictures on Grindr. And if things are okay, <laughs> fine, come on over. You know, but it's like, yeah, yeah. So I think that technology has also changed that too. It's sometimes yeah. in a weird way too, because I think people present themselves differently online. Sure, because they, they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that it's how, easier to be fake. I mean, everybody how, works on their Facebook profile and nobody works on their real profile, you know? Right, exactly. Um, Mateo, how, how does your insecurity with all this stuff affect relationships and stuff? Mm, to, you I just, know? spitting out my... Um, well, I have, a, I have ugh, relationships. I've only had two real relationships in my mm-hmm. life when I was in early 20s. And my last one that was pretty recent. And um, neither one I would say was normal in the sense that like one was long distance and the other one was sort of long distance and he was in out of the closet and stuff. I don't know. I, I get a lot of anxiety when it comes to relationships and I long for the idea of being in one and then presented with it. I can, I start to like overwhelm myself and get really insecure. And what I, is it that scares you about being in a long-term relationship? Well, I think an easy answer is to be like, I'm trapped. And then the other answer is, um, not being able to accept that someone likes me. Like I've noticed yeah. if a guy likes me too quickly, I'm suspicious. Yeah. We were just talking and, about that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm sort of like more attracted to like a challenge or someone who's always a little out of reach. I don't yeah. know if that's because I don't like myself or I'm a comic well, it's, and I like it's, challenge. It's, it's all it's these definitely, things. Cause I mean, it, it, it boils down to not liking yourself because you, it's almost like, why would they be suspicious? If you think, if you recognize how awesome you are, then when you meet somebody, they're like, they, you can't, but you got to believe that you're awesome and, you, and you're just a dope person. So it just stands the reason that some, because you are so awesome that they would like you right away. Like, why would you not? I mean, it's, it's the difference in going, Hey, do you want this $10,000 in cash? Or do you want this, uh, 35 cents? And in, in, you know what I mean? It just, it just right. doesn't, it doesn't make sense to not want that, you know? So I, I think, um, you know, one of the, things, and, and there's a lot of, you know, men in general who are going that they, they never look at, the person that they think is judging them. So for me, another little technique is when somebody's criticizing me, I always go, well, is this person, does this come from a place of love or does this somebody trying to bring me down a notch? And, right. he, and, and, and as soon as I recognize that maybe 
it may not come from a place of love, then what I do a lot of times is I will start to pick this person apart. Like, what? what, what who are you? Who the fuck are you? Mm-hmm. Like, what did you accomplish? Like, who mm-hmm. are you? You're not really that interesting. You don't really look that good. You're not really that successful. You don't have really have any discipline. You're, like, how dare you think that you could judge me when you're such a piece of garbage? You so you're, so you're a lot stronger than I am because I my instincts would not be like... I don't know if it's Catholic guilt and I feel like it's going to come bite me in the ass, but I never have the confidence to be like, you're nothing. And look what I've done. Cause I feel like, Oh, that's going to come bite me in the ass, <laughs> you know? So I just always like blame myself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. always like, it's my fault. It's my problem. I did something wrong. I mean, I don't know. I feel like, uh, I, I, you know, I also am a strange person in the sense that like, I had this relationship when I was 22. We broke up. It was very tempestuous. And then I just decided I'm going to become a stand-up comedian. And I just was like, nothing was going to get in my way. I, I moved to New York. I did stand-up every night. I didn't drink. I didn't go out. I didn't date. I, did, I barely did any of that. I just mm-hmm. wanted to do stand-up, 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 stand-up. And so when I, now that like, obviously I've found a certain amount of success where like, I'm not dying to get on stage or I'm dying to do open mics anymore. I feel more right. confident that I'm going to get stage time. Right. It becomes a little more balanced. I would say in my life now yeah. that it's opened up a space to have a relationship when I'm presented with that, I don't know what to do. Right. It's like, I'm still 21 mentally. Like I don't, yeah. you know, guys will date me and be like, like oh, essentially like what's wrong with you? Like, but they've also been in tons of relationships. Yeah. They've, they've, got, they've got more stage time. In, in exactly relationships. Right. And I'm an open micer. <laughs> so it's like, try, is this like an open micer tr- trying to date the equivalent of Chris Rock? I'm like, I don't have this, yeah. you know, chutzpah. It's, it's, it's funny because um, that's the same conversation I had with Yamanika because Yamanika was heavy in the church. And so she didn't lose her virginity until she was 26 years old. She mm-hmm. talks about this. And so her, like, when I was three, I was trying to finger pop girls. When I was in third grade, I was trying to finger pop and, and I was dealing with, oh, you like me and check X. And I, I was always kind of interested in, in little girls and trying, you know, I was a little dirty little kid with mirrors on my shoes and trying to look under girls dresses and shit like that. So but but those were the those were the that was the, the open micing, you know, what mm. I mean, pulling girls ponytails and and stuff like that. And so. You know, when you when you when you're 26 and you just started, you're you're an open micer in relationships, and these people who have been, which is interesting, because you'll find sometimes like my um my nephew was super scared, like his mother was like so like a helicopter mom, helicopter, and, yeah. and and so she so he was always afraid, and then he he I don't think I think he lost his virginity much later, and. And so he now he's older and he's dealing with these women who have been they've had all kinds of dicks in and in, in and out of already all kinds of situations and they're so much more advanced. Mm-hmm. Um, Mateo, I want to can we um, let's shut it down. I want you to plug everything and then we're going to do something um, sure. a little after hours thing for the um, Patreon for the, for the people Patreon. over at Patreon. To join um, us. What's your what's your uh, your Instagram and everything and anything that you want to plug real quick? Um, Matteo Lane, M A T T E O L A N E on Instagram. It's all my drawings in my ass. And then my <laughs> He is podcasts. not exaggerating, by the way. It is a lot of amazing amazing drawings and a lot of Matteo's ass. Good follow. It's a good follow as we say in the biz. Yeah, I really should just start an op- op- uh, OnlyFans. Um, and then if you want to listen to my podcast, it's with Emma Willman. It's called Inside the Closet and it's every Thursday and we're just chit-chatting about life. That's dope. That's dope. Uh, Harry, you want to uh, yeah, you can go to uh, all my stuff is at Harry Turjanian, all my social media stuff. Uh, you could go to uh, check out Catalyst Wrestling. I'm still involved with that as well. Um, but also definitely check out the Man School 202 Instagram page at Real Man School 202. And also uh, the Man School uh, 202 YouTube page. Yeah. Um, with me, everything Dante Nero. Dante Nero's the, the YouTube and everything else. Uh, the Dante Nero on Instagram. Don't forget the Man School 202 uh, YouTube page and the Instagram Real Man School. Um, and and also- the one on one on one consultations too. If you want to go to Dante Nero.com and click on consult. Go ahead. You were going to say something. I'm Harry? just going to say, um, join us over, over on the Man School 202 Patreon. Because uh, we're going to continue talking with Mateo. We have bonus content. We do listener mail up there. Some uh, 
exclusive visual visual content up there as well. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff over there, and you can get priority access to questions. We message everybody. It's it's a lot of fun. So head over to the Man School Two Two Patreon. Yeah, and support us because y'all said that I'm dope. So. <laughs> Man School 202 is created by Dante Nero, hosted by Dante Nero with Harry Turjanian and Andre D. Thompson, produced by Harry Turjanian, executive producers Matt Kleinschmidt, Harry Turjanian, and Dante Nero.